and welcome to the Bible Verses Everyday Life, where we take everyday things and answer them with the Word of God. We are going to introduce ourselves. My name is Erica Holsey. I'm Pastor Nelson Mercado. I'm Jean-Luc Mercado. I'm Ravala Lequay. And we are starting our second part of our series of What's Up With Alcohol. That was the episode before this one, so you can feel free to check that out. And this one, we're going to be talking about the Bible and alcohol. And Pastor, we had a question. We did have a question, but before we answer that question, let us have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you to study your word. We pray that you'll give us clarity, understanding, and the willingness to follow through. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We did receive a question from Tiffany Lindsay uh, about the word wine in the Bible. In other words, uh, her question had to do with, uh, are there times in Scripture where the word wine means fermented grape juice, and are there times when it means unfermented grape juice, and, and how do we know the difference? Now, th this is a, a, a good question, uh, and it is actually a sort of a complex one. It, it, it's going to take more of me just say, okay, yes, yeah, sometimes it's um, fermented and sometimes not. There's a little more details, so I'll, I'll try my best to answer this question for Tiffany and for those of you who probably may have the same question. Now, in, in today's English dictionaries, if you were to look up the word wine, you'll find you know, the definition that it is fermented grape juice or the fermented juice of grapes. Uh, and it, the definition makes no allowance for the possibility that wine could signify unfermented grape juice. And, and I think that because of that, many uh, well-meaning Christians uh, they interpret the word wine in the Bible as only alcohol, and, and they see that maybe as a justification to drink alcohol themselves. It's sort of like, I guess I can explain this using a syllogism. Uh, you see that on the screen. Uh, the Bible, like today's English language, knows only of alcoholic wine. Now, that's not something that I'm saying. This is something this is the logic that prevails out there, that the, the Bible, just like the English dictionaries, only knows of alcoholic wine. Therefore, wine, of course, uh, is, uh, is praised in the Bible as a gracious divine blessing. We see that. We'll see that here in a little bit, that when you look at the Bible, yes, you see the word wine in connection with God's divine blessing. So this is the conclusion that they come up with. Well, therefore, the Bible approves of the moderate consumption of alcoholic beverage. This is the conclusion that they come up with. This is a false syllogism, really, because the Bible actually knows of two different types of grape beverages. The first unfermented, which is, of course, refreshing, it is lawful. And then the second is the fermented one, which is intoxicating, it is, it is unlawful. Now, to better understand this, this issue of the word wine, we, we need to see how this word was used both in secular and the secular use, and also how it was used in the Bible. Now, again, most people uh, uh, when they look at the word wine, they, they interpret it as it, it can only mean the alcoholic beverage. But that wasn't always the case, by the way. But, but I want to show you Miriam's, uh, Miriam Webster's dictionary, um, how it defines uh, wine. Notice it says that it is the fermented grape juice containing varying percentages of alcohol or the fermented juice of a plant product used as a beverage. Now, this is a very restrictive definition, but it, it is actually a departure from the more classical and dual meaning of the word. Uh, here's an example. Back in 1955, uh, uh, Funk and Wagnall's New Standard Dictionary of the English Language defined wines as follows. Notice, the fermented juice of the grape, in loose language, the juice of the grape, whether fermented or not. So notice that here in 1955, this word wine had a different connotation than it does today. It included the unfermented grape juice. A more recent one, 1971, the new Webster uh, Encyclopedic Dictionary of the English Language defines must. Now, notice must is the freshly crushed juice, the fruit juice that contains the skin, the stems, and the seeds. But it defines it as wine or juice pressed 
from the grapes, but not fermented. So notice, wine is defined as not fermented. Older dictionaries, uh, I wanted to show you, uh, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary defines the word must that we've already seen as new wine pressed from the grape, but not fermented. And, and as far back as 1737, the English translation of the Antiquities of the Jews, written by a historian Josephus, says that wine is to be squeezed from the clusters. So clearly, the juice freshly squeezed from the clusters is not fermented. It's, it's juice straight out of the fruit. Like if you put, you know, take a bunch of grapes and put it in your juicer at home, and you make juice, well, it's not going to be fermented. It's just grape juice. Now, uh, uh, you may wonder, why am I quoting some of these older resources? Well, it's important because it, it tells us that the Old English Dictionary suggests that when the King James Version of the Bible was completed back in 1611, the translators must have understood the word wine to mean both the fermented grape juice and the unfermented grape juice. Now, it's also significant for us to look at the Latin word uh, for wine, which is the word venom, the word venom, and, uh, and notice that this word venom is actually, it was actually also used to mean both the fermented grape juice and the unfermented. Notice from the, uh, the Latin lexicon Thesaurus uh, Linguae Latina, uh, published in 1740, it actually gives uh, several definitions to venom, among which it says, Aglusis uh, vinum, which is uh, defined as sweet wine, and defrutum vinum, or boiled wine, both of which were actually unfermented grape juice. Now, now before we look at how this word, uh, the word wine was used in scripture, we gotta look at the, uh, take a quick look at the secular use of the Greek word oinos. You see that on the screen too. Greek word oinos, you may wonder, well, why am I uh, uh, using a, the Greek word for it. Well, it's it, very simple. The New Testament was written in Greek. So when we look at the New Testament and the word wine, how the word wine is used in the New Testament, well, this word wine is translated from this Greek word uh, oinos. So this is why we got to look at this. But I want to share you with you a, a source, uh, a secular source of how this word was used. Aristotle, in his book, uh, Meteorologica, clearly refers to grape juice as one of two kinds of wine. He said that um, he referred to sweet, a sweet grape beverage, which though called wine, and notice in the, in the brackets, oinos, it has not the effect of wine, for it does not taste like wine and does not intoxicate like ordinary wine. So he's talking about, you know, the un um, unfermented grape juice, but notice he calls it oinos. Now, in Hebrew, the word for that we know as wine in Hebrew is yayin. Why am I looking at the Hebrew word? Well, because the Old Testament was written in, uh, in, in Hebrew. And so when we see the word wine in the Old Testament, most of the time is this word yayin. And I want to show to you two uh, secular sources uh, of how this word yayin is used. Uh, the first one is the Jewish Encyclopedia. Uh, it provides a concise description of the various uses of yayin, and it says fresh wine before fermenting was called yayin migat, which means wine of the vat. Now, a more recent one, Encyclopedia Judaica uh, of 1971, says that the newly pressed wine prior to fermentation was known as yayin migat, again, wine from the vat. So both these Jewish encyclopedias uh, uh, clearly tell us that the, the word or the term yayin was used to refer to a variety of wines, including, notice, the newly pressed wine prior to fermentation. And so, so far, what we have seen is that these words, uh, uh, wine, venom, oinos, and yayin, have been used historically uh, to refer to the fresh uh, fresh pressed juice of the grape, whether fermented or unfermented. And as we'll see now, the same thing happens in the Bible. The same thing happens in the Bible. Now, as I said earlier, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and so the word that is most frequently translated as wine is yayin. Now, sometimes this word receives God's approval, sometimes it doesn't. Now, no doubt 
that this word yayin uh, frequently refers to the intoxicating alcoholic wine, if you will. And, and I want to show you a few examples, uh, some of which we actually mentioned on our previous episode. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 9 and verses 20 and 21. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine, yayin, and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Yeah, we saw this, uh, this passage in our previous uh, episode. Uh, obviously, Noah got drunk. He drank this wine, referred to as yayin, and he got drunk. And we know the, the negative things that happened afterwards to, him, to, to his family and their posterity. So this is a, a negative uh, a narrative of, of, of this situation with, with Noah. But clearly, this refers to into, the intoxicating wine. There's another story in Genesis about Lot's, uh, Lot and his daughters, found in uh, Genesis 19, verses 32 and 33. The Lord says, Come let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, and we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. So you saw on the screen uh, in the passage the word in the brackets, yayin, when uh, the word wine is mentioned. Uh, this is a story about incest. Uh, 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 Lot's daughters got him drunk. He was so drunk that he didn't even know, he couldn't even notice that he was actually having sexual relations with his own daughters. A story of incest, clearly a negative portrayal, uh, a negative story uh, where yayin is used. So clearly this refers to the intoxicating beverage. Um, now, the, the more classical condemnation uh, of the use of intoxicating wine, we saw this one in our last episode, is found in Proverbs chapter 23 and verses 31 and 32. It says, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in a cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Yeah, it, it is clearly the intoxicating wine that, 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 that bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. It causes all kinds of problems. And now, the use of the word yayin to refer to the unfermented grape juice is not as obvious, primarily because it does not receive uh, God's condemnation like it does uh, the, the intoxicating variety uh, receives. Uh, but here is one example that we find uh, the word yayin uh, to refer to the unfermented variety. Uh, Isaiah chapter 16 and verse 10. Gladness is taken away and joy from the plentiful field. In the vineyards there will be no singing, nor will there be shouting. No treaders will tread out wine in the presses. I have made their shouting cease. Now, the context of this passage is the judgment of God upon his people. Now, one way God would judge his people was by removing the blessings that he had bestowed upon him. And among those blessings, obviously, was the summer fruit and what we saw uh, uh, actually here, the, 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 uh, the wine, uh, uh, in the presses. Now, clearly, this refers to the unfermented variety because it's talking about the harvest. You know, God judged his people by removing the blessings of the harvest. And so uh, the wine referred to here clearly must be the unfermented variety because notice it says, no treaders will tread out wine in the presses. You know, the, the, the wine out, freshly out of the, the fruit is not fermented because fermentation is a time-controlled process. So clearly here, Isaiah is talking about, uh, uh, uses the word yayin, but it refers to the unfermented variety. Uh, here's another example. We find it in Jeremiah chapter 40 and verses 10 and 12. But you gather wine, notice again in the brackets yayin, and summer fruit and oil, and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Then all the Jews returned out of all their places where they had been driven and came into the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah and gathered wine, notice yayin, and summer fruit in abundance. Now, now these words are from Gedaliah, the, the, the Babylonian governor who wanted uh, to, to encourage the Jews who had actually fled the neighboring cities to return back to, uh, to Judah 
And, and in both cases, the term yayin here is used to refer to the fruit of the vine. Again, he, he talks about the summer fruit in abundance, wine in the summer fruit. This is talking about the solid fruits. It's not talking about wine that has been already fermented. Uh, again, it refers to the unfermented variety. Now, uh, there are plenty of, plenty of other examples in the Old Testament that we can look at, but time does not permit. We need to look at the New Testament. Again, the New Testament written in Greek, so the word that we're looking for is oinos, that is translated as wine. And uh, uh, one of the clearest examples of the use of oinos as the intoxicated drink is found in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So clearly this is the intoxicating variety. Uh, uh, Paul is making a contrast. Listen, he's, don't, don't be filled with that wine. Be filled with the Spirit. So clearly this is the intoxicating grape juice that he's talking about here. Uh, however, oinos is also used for the unfermented grape juice. We find an example in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. It says that, um, nor do they put new one into old wineskins, or lest the wineskins break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Now from this passage we gather that it was customary in the time of Jesus to put new wine into new wineskins in order to preserve both the wine and the, the wineskins. Now, here Jesus is talking about, he refers to new wine, that is, wine fresh from the press, which was strained and boiled uh, and placed into new wineskins, and then it was made airtight. But he's referring to fresh wine, fresh grape juice, clearly uh, a juice that had not had the, the time to ferment. So in this case, clearly uh, Matthew refers to the unfermented grape juice, but he refers to it as oinos, again, the same word that we saw Paul talk about in Ephesians 5.18. So clearly we see that is referred to both the fermented variety and the unfermented variety. Here's one more example I'd like to share with you in Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. The wine is there, the oinos there, and you see there in the brackets. Now, in context, the warning against hurting the oil and the wine sets limits to the destruction which the black horse was to carry out. If you, if you remember reading about the four horses of the apocalypse, this is what, this is what it's talking about in Revelation 6. Now, in the context of this warning, it, we, it's, it's the destruction of the harvest. Notice the reference to oil and wine. And that's important because it shows that these two terms could use to refer to the solid fruits. Again, the harvest. The oil obviously is produced by the olive and the wine is produced by the grape. So it's talking about the actual fruit. So clearly in this case, the word oinos refers to the unfermented grape juice. And, and you, know, you know, I know that this has been a, a long answer to this question, but, but what we have seen is that interpreting the word wine uh, in the Bible as just the alcoholic grape juice, it has no basis has no basis because we've seen from secular sources and from the Bible itself that the word was used both for the fermented grape juice and the unfermented grape juice. You may ask, well, how do I know which, uh, which one is being used? Well, the context of the passage. And, and to, to, to read the context, sometimes you've got to read the verses before, the verses after. Sometimes you may have to read the entire chapter, in some cases the entire book, to understand what the context of the passage is saying. But what we've seen uh, in, in our brief discussion uh, here this, um, th this evening is that every time the word wine is refers to the fermented variety, there's something negative about it. There's a negative story, something that happens that is bad, uh, uh, whereas the unfermented variety is God's blessing. So again, uh, 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 Tiffany, that you asked this question, yes, the, the word wine refers to both fermented and unfermented in the context we'll reveal how it is used.
Well, amen. amen, Pastor, for that very detailed and rich answer to that question, because I know that that is a question that a lot of people mm -hmm. have on their mind. Yeah. And so one of the things that we want to look at is what do Christians say about alcoholic beverages? And so I was able to find some statistics. We're going to look at some numbers um, from LifeWave Research. They did a poll on churchgoers and churchgoers from the ages of 18 to 34 are evenly split on their alcohol consumption. So 50% say that drinking alcohol is okay, and the other 50% says they do not. 41% of churchgoers between the ages of 35 and 49, they drink, while 59% say they do not. 44% of churchgoers from 50 to 64 year old say that they consume alcohol and 56% say they do not. Now churchgoers ages 65 and above are the group less likely to drink alcohol with 32% saying they do, they do consume alcohol with 68% saying they do not. The share of churchgoers who say scripture teaches against any kind of alcohol consumption has decreased by 6% points over the last decade. And 2007, 29% said scripture directs people to never drink alcohol while 68% disagree. So over time, over half of Christians, churchgoers, decided that the scripture does not teach against drinking alcoholic beverages. And so that number is high because we'd hope if we are carrying the name of Christ that the number would be none. But it is a very high number of people who believe that consuming alcoholic beverages are OK and they do attend church. So it could be any of us. All right. And a lot of people look to the story of the wedding of Cana. Right. And uh, John, Luke, you're going to share some information on that with us now, aren't you? Yeah. So to start off, let's actually turn to this story. So it's found in the Gospel of John, chapter two. And starting in verse one. And I'll be reading from the New King James. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to, his, to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some, draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, when we read this passage, we, we keep on reading this word wine, which we have already discussed. This is the word being used here in the original language is oinos. And as, as already discussed, oinos does not denote either fermented or unfermented grape juice, wine, all you have to do is, depending on the context, well, what's the context here? Well, we really, really can't say specifically until we start doing some research. There's things you can look through the Bible. We already have gone through that. There's also some historical uh, indications of what even people, what everyone would have considered good wine. In fact, there's a quote from Albert Barnes. It says, uh, he was a well-known te uh, New Testament scholar and commentator, and he gives a warning on John 2.10 
to not be deceived by the phrase good wine, the reason he, he explains is we use the phrase to denote that it is good in proportion to its strength and its power to intoxicate. But no such sense, no such sense is to be attached to the word here. So we're definitely not, we're, we're being told we can't just automatically assume this means uh, high alcoholic uh, content, ABV, uh, alcohol, alcohol by volume. Uh, in fact, it's not even just the Greeks or even the Jews who couldn't distinguish in the beginning. Uh, Dr. Frederick Lees, uh, who is a scholar in England, tells us, in Hebrew, Chaldee, uh, Chaldee, Greek, Syriac, Arabic, Latin, and English, the word for wine in all these languages are originally and always and inclusively applied to the blood of the grape in its primitive and natural condition as well subsequently as the juice both boiled and fermented. So when you look at ancient languages, even old forms of modern languages, the word wine does not show any difference between it being everyday grape juice or high spirit. Now some would argue that it doesn't matter if it didn't distinguish because the best way to preserve something back in the day, back in ancient times, was to ferment it. But amazingly, that is not true. Many classical writers of, of the time of Jesus told us that you could, things would be preserved better if it was not fermented. Uh, Camello, who, is, uh, who was an agriculturalist during that time, a Roman agriculturalist, when he, he talks about how they preserved pears. It's like before they are ripe, but not, uh, before they're ripe, but when they are no longer quite raw, examine them carefully to see that they are sound and free from blemish or worms, and then arrange them in an earth, earthware vessel that has been treated with pitch and fill it with resin wine or must boil down to one third of its original volume so that all the fruit is submerged. Then put a cover on top and plaster it up. So we see here from Colomella that you could preserve fruit off, you know, off the vine, off the tree, if you did, did certain actions. Another uh, scholar, we have, his, we have his quote on screen, Pliny the Elder, uh, who uh, was a Roman scholar, naturalist, and contemporary of Columella, briefly describes in his work, Natural History, that a uh, way to preserve grapes. Some grapes will last all through the winter if the clusters are hung by a string from the ceiling, and others will keep merely in their own natural vigor by being stood in earthenware jars with casts put over them and packed round with fermenting grape skins. So even Pliny here show, tells us that it was quite easy to preserve fresh grapes throughout the winter. And to the subject of fermented wine, Pliny actually has more to say. Uh, when it comes to fermented wine, it says, frankly, it is a particularity of, of wine among liquids to go moldy or else turn into vinegar and whole volumes of instructions how to remedy, th remedy this have been published. So the Romans, Pliny being a major scholar, they acknowledged wine as being a hard, fermented wine being a hard thing to preserve. In fact, they needed instructions, books of instructions on just how to reverse the moldiness, the, the vinegariness of wine. 
as you mentioned the vinegarness, it, it just brought back to my mind as Jesus hung on the cross, what was the one thing they gave him on the sponge? It was, it was a vinegar tasting mm. beverage. So it could very well have been the fermented wine that you were, you were speaking of, and he did not partake of that, even though it was given to him. Yeah, and going even further, what is good wine? We, now we know that the ancients knew how to preserve, and they knew the difference between fermented and unfermented. What did the ancients think of what would be considered good wine? Was that universal? And pretty much it was. During the time of, during the first century, it was, there was a universal thought of what good wine would be. Would be. So, plenty, we have, I have a few quotes from people from the first century. Pliny the Elder, he states, wine is most beneficial when its potency has been removed by a strainer. Plutarch, who was another contemporary of Pliny, points out, points out that wine is much more pleasant to drink when it neither inflames the brain nor infests the mind or passions. So we, here we have Romans, not Christians, pagan Romans who are saying good wine is wine that doesn't, doesn't intoxicate. Good wine is, doesn't have a potency. Uh, well, even amongst the Jews in the Mishnah, Rab, Rabbi Yehuda permits boiled wine as heavy offering because it improves its quality. So amongst the Jews, boiled wine, which is, if you, anyone who's ever cooked with wine understands, when you're cooking with wine, it removes the alcohol, so you just remain with the taste of the wine. That is considered the best. Uh, in the Keto Cyclopedia of Biblical Literature, they point out such a wine was esteemed among the Jews as the richest and best wine. So if you wanted the best wine, you wanted boiled wine. Hmm. So it's safe to assume when you're looking at the context of history that this was ubiquitous amongst the people of the time, this idea that the best wine was wine that tasted with, had a taste without alcohol. Closest to the vine. Closest to the vine. There you but go. Right, off the, right out of the vineyard. So, so it may be then, you know, because the issue may be this, this, this term good wine. Today, good wine is interpreted, oh, it must be that's the strong, the strong alcoholic stuff. wine. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what happens is what we, we interpret the Bible by putting today's definition into the Bible and say, well, that's what it means today, that's what it must have meant back then, but that's not the way you interpret the Bible. I guess, you know, the fact that it's called wine is not because it's high in alcohol, it's because Jesus just created it, it was fresh. And going even further, a little bit in history, we note, you know, um, Barnes, who we quoted earlier, he notes, Pliny, Plutarch, and others describe good wine as, uh, or mention the best wine as that which is harmless or innocent. In fact, probably the best wine was called Poculus Vini Innocentis. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can You're speak some Latin. Latin. <laughs> uh, and even in the early church, we're talking even upwards in the six hundred, you know, first millennium of the church. There was, a, they had a discussion on what type of wine to use during communion. And as then the third council of Braga, they have charge uh, charges those who present no other wine at the sacrament of the Lord's cup but what they pressed out of the clusters of grapes. That is to say, the, be the wine that, they were that was meant to be used at communion would be the, the wine that was just pressed, just freshly pressed grapes. And it is noteworthy that fresh grape juice, which is called wine, the charge use, uses unfermented grape juice as such, but you know, you can just use that grape juice, but the only type of mixture, if you were to look at the Council of Braga from that time, the only thing you could mix with that wine was water. So it's again, this idea that in ancient times, even to what could be considered modern times, unfermented grape juice was the number one to go to. 
Now, the big question is, why does Jesus use this miracle as his first miracle? Why is it that we have wine? There's a lot of, there, there's plenty of reasons where we can bring it, but one thing we have to come into consideration is how much gallons of wine did, did Jesus create? It says, for each one of these vessels, it was 20 or 30 gallons. So we're looking between 120 to 100 and 60 gallons of wine meant for a wedding, which will have lasted days, given to men, women, and children. So if Jesus made alcoholic wine, would it not be considered irresponsible to have that much gallons of wine given to all these people of different ages for multiple days? It would you know, be the first act of binge drinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I think the problem is that we don't think about these things. You know, even today, you probably heard stories about bartenders who give, uh, uh, continue to give alcohol to, say, a person that is clearly drunk, and that person leaves the bar, drives, and kills somebody. The bartender, the bar owner, is held responsible for yeah, that liable. because he continued to give alcohol to this person who was clearly inebriated and, and, and killed this other person. So think about what that means for Jesus. If Jesus, who already in his word condemned the use of alcohol, even if, if it's just getting drunk with it, like some would suggest, in this case, this is a wedding that lasts for days, so clearly they would have been drunk but Jesus would have given him more alcohol, and not only just a couple of cups, but 120 or 160 gallons of alcohol. What would that say of Jesus? He would have been responsible and contradicted his own work. And as you say that, it reminds me of our last episode where we were talking about moderation. That's right. So it's like now you have all this alcohol, and you're expecting these people who are yeah, at moderate. a feast, yeah. at, a, at a party, if you will, to drink in moderation. Yeah. Yeah. All of this alcohol for days at a time. It, it, it just seems weird in and, thought. And that brings me to the point with, uh, with the scholar Joseph P. Free. He rightly observes that if we're going to take, look into the context of what we're reading here, this there's only two different types of proofs that are here. Either one, Christ is allowing excessive drinking of alcohol, which is going against Scripture. We've already read many Scriptures that show Drinking of alcohol, a strong drink, is a mocker. Is a mocker. Is a brawler. Or two, this is this is a contradictory point. The oinos, the wine used here, has to be grape juice. And I would argue it has to be grape juice because this wine is representing Christ. Mm -hmm. This this is why it's to Jesus' glory. That's why John says this is to Jesus' glory because the wine that Christ made was high quality but not alcoholic because it was representing Christ and it was new wine, freshly created, not old or decayed wine that had to go through months of yeast turning, into, turning sugar into alcohol. It didn't go through any of that. It was instantaneous wine which represents God, Jesus' glory. So that word good, we can't just think of it in the Greek term, agathos, which is not even what it's used, which is just the word good, but kalos, which means morally excellent or benefiting. And we think about Jesus, he was the first fruits. Mm -hmm. And so if he made it, he made the best. He, he gave made, the first fruits himself. He made, yeah, made the best himself. And that's why, you know, when you look at the wedding in Cana, it makes more it makes a hundred times more sense that Jesus gave unfermented wine to the people rather than fermented wine as is, you know, modern Well, you know, in verse 10, uh, it also says um, when the guests were well drunk, and the uh, common interpretation that is given, well, they were well drunk. I like it. They, yeah. were, they were drunk. But that's not what, when you look at the, the Greek, that's not what the, this phrase means. It simply means well, they, they, were, they drank freely. 
That's basically what it means. Uh, you know, this is what's Jesus' first miracle. And all of Jesus' miracles were for the good of the people who did, he did miracles for. Uh, if Jesus gave all these people 160 gallons of booze, this was not for their benefit. It would have been for their detriment. He would have been harming them, and he's trying to make the disciples believe in him so that he will be glorified. That certainly would not have glorified Jesus. He would have contradicted himself uh, and his word, and his disciples would not believe in him. So uh, I think it's pretty clear that this, this, the, this incident, the weddings at Cana, it, it, this is talking about unfermented uh, grape juice. Again, it is used as the word oinos. So. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for giving us a, a little bit more depth. Uh, I learned so much. And I'm so excited to have heard that and walk away myself with a better understanding of that story as well. Amen. But there is another passage that people commonly use, which is in 1 Timothy. And uh, Rivaldo, you're going to kind of tell us a little bit about this one as yes. well. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, can we move to 1 Timothy 5, verse 23? It says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and f your frequent infirmities. So people think this is simple to understand this text, that it's okay to drink um, wine in moderate use. They think um, since Paul, they view this as Paul saying, this is an okay for us to all um, drink this um, moderately. Um, that wine is healthy and not hazardous to our body. Mm -hmm. um, there was an author, his name, he was in the 1800s. His name was Howard H. Charles that argued that Paul's directives did not want to forbid all use of wine, but sought to regulate its use. So that uh, this advice that Tim Paul was trying to give to Timothy has been used for 19 centuries to sully what they were really talking about. Um, countless people have used this to justify why, they've, uh, why they drink alcohol beverages. They say, that's good for you, because Paul says it's good for you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Most come to this text for answers, but this is why it's important for us to establish what Paul's counsel to Timothy ha and how it has applied to us, to, how it applies to us today. Um, if we break this down... If we break down this text, we will see its counsel. What people don't see is that the Greek verb kroma, meaning to use or to take, was translated as our English word drink. So that for me, that's... That's a big jump. <laughs> it's a pretty big jump. I don't know why would you translate it to that. Yeah, word. like what? Where did you get drinking from just taking? <laughs> it's pretty far, but let's take it as what it was originally said as take. And let, if we use the adjective oligos, meaning little, the adjective, the Greek adjective oligos, meaning little, the text says, take a little wine, take a little wine with water. It's more, it sounds more like a doctor prescribing something to a patient which is good for you and like it's take a pill or take this yeah, yeah like a, like uh, like you have some people that like putting some extra like uh electrolytes into their water it's like it's more it's not a principle it's more like more like prescription um it so this is why it is generally assumed that the wine paul recommended to timothy was alcoholic and I can, uh, as you're reading that, I'm thinking a lot of times when we have moder our modern day ailments, we, we may use juice to, to help with, aid with that. Right. So if you're dealing with urinary things, you, people tell you drink cranberry juice. Yeah. Or if you're having um, gastro issues, they say take a little prune juice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the doctor is always telling you when you're sick to do what? Increase your water intake. So it's like when you, when you said that and it's used as a medical use or intended for a medical type use, 
that that makes that resonates with me as in it makes sense. Mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So there are two reasons why what people have been saying and why why they have been why they've been like bringing this logic, which they think is true, to um, this saying is um, the first reason is the Greek term oinus means wine or was used in a generic way to denote either fermented wine, which is our, in our today, it's our wine, or unfermented wine, grape juice. Just wanted to bring this into my, in my, um, my saying. Second, there was testimonies attesting the use in the ancient world of unfermented wine for medical purposes. Um, Aristotle, a Greek philosopher and polymath that lived during the classical period in ancient Greece during 384 to 322 BC, recommended Greek term glucose, meaning sweet grape juice. He said, though called wine, oenus, as already explained, it has not the effect of wine and does not intoxicate like ordinary wine. So this probably tastes like, of course, like our grape juice. It's not toxic, it's, not, it's sweet. Mm -hmm. um, Athenus, a gr grammarian, specifically, specifically counsels in 280 AD the use of the Latin term glucon, oin, oin, Oinos, yeah. oinon, meaning grape juice, what most called during that time sweet wine for stomach disorders. He said, let him take sweet wine either mixed with water or warmed, especially that kind called pro propos, propopos, Latin term for unfermented grape juice. I have to bring these terms for, to translate over. For sweet, for sweet wine does not make the head heavy. So this is very similar to what um, Paul, Paul's advice to Timothy. You know and, and the funny part is I, I know people who drink and they would never add water to their wine. Yeah. <laughs> they would never add that. So when you see that component, I mean, it, my mind automatically would not go to an alcoholic beverage. And think of me looking at what they're saying here, you know, the sweet wine is used so that you don't have a hard head, you know, get a heavy head it's like you don't get that headache you don't get that hangover, hangover yeah so like they're saying you know you don't want to have a hangover while you're sick anyway yeah so here's use this type of wine the sweet wine this grape juice just so that you can for health for your so, health so what you're saying there uh, uh rivaldo is that it, it was well known even back then that there were some medicinal uh, properties that the uh the grape juice had yes that, that would help uh, and if you were to look it up today, you, you, you could just Google this, and you can see that grape juice has actually some uh, antiviral properties, so it is very good for you. Uh, and, in, and in case of, uh, apparently, Timothy's issues, that it would have been helpful for his issues. Thank you for all that. That was all very, um, basically what I'm saying, and I thank you for that. Um, let's move to Timothy um, chapter 3, 1 through 7. For, so that's 1 Timothy 3. Yeah, First Timothy three. One through seven or one through three? One through yeah, let's do one through three. Okay. This it says this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. So going back to Paul's counsel to Timothy, these are what they are. They are people that are not covetous. They don't drink wine. This was not common for them. And why would they even, this would be out of their principles, first of all, because God advised them not to do these things, as you see in um, uh, Levit Leviticus chapter 10, um, 9 through 11. Can we move there? Leviticus. It 
says, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting. Least you die, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between holy and, and, and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the status which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So this is what they were taught, that they knew what was clean and what was unclean, and wine was viewed as unclean by God. Why would, why would God change now when he, he does not change? Mm -hmm. This is what he said, and this saying from um, Paul, when it says no, when Paul says no longer drink only water, he implies that Timothy only drank water and did not partake in the drinking of both fermented and unfermented wine. This means that the apostle may well be clarifying his position that to keep pure, that to keep pure did not require him to only drink water. He could rightly use some grape juice to relieve him of his stomach problems and frequent ail ailments. Mm. And I can really appreciate the fact that you use the scripture from the Old Testament mm -hmm. and the New Testament, which shows consistency. Mm -hmm. So it did not change when it reached the New Testament that those things or, or those uh, requirements were done away with. Now, mind you, the, the, the Old Testament passage, you know, had to do with the priests. And here in First Timothy, as you read in chapter 3, were the qualifications for the bishop, the overseer, which Timothy, of course, a young leader in the church, so these words apply to him, but apparently, because he was, a, 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 um, you nice know, a, as reverend, a priest, a very uh, reverent, and even perhaps even a, Naz a Nazarite, he had been abstain abstaining from a number of things, and notice, he was probably only drinking water, like you said. Yes. So Paul says, oh, just drink only water, but drink a little bit of wine here, but primarily because of the stomach issues. Yeah, for, so for Paul and Timothy to drink wine moderately would go against their principles, like I've said before. And when Paul counsels Timothy, he does not say, no longer drink water, but rather no longer drink only water. Mm -hmm. He does not say drink wine, but rather no longer drink only water. He does not say for the physical pleasure of your belly, but for the medical, for your medical needs and your and your stomach, whether the wine was fermented or unfermented, this does not support the regular use of wine in any way. And, and I think that's the point. Uh, even even as we see in the word oinos, because you be used for fermented and unfermented. But even if we, if, for the sake of argument, uh, the oinos there is the fermented, and, and Paul's telling Timothy to drink a little bit of fermented grape juice. That still doesn't give us a license to say, well, that's good for everybody, because this was an advice specifically targeted to Timothy, because specifically because he was having some issues, stomach issues, and as we've seen, grape juice was used in, as a medicine, uh, uh, sort of like a medicine, and, and to treat these things, and, and this is what Timothy needed. So in no way this uh, excuses the use of alcohol for pleasure. Uh, if anything, this just highlights, yes, there's some medicinal purposes for it, and this is what Paul is advising Timothy to do, but it's not a license for any Christian to say, well, you know, alcohol is good for you, so might as well just let's drink, drink up. Eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> going, going based off that, when we said this in our, in our last episode, that almost anything that, ha any study that shows that al the alcoholic drinks have a health benefit, it's never the alcohol, because everyone agrees actual alcohol is a poison, it's the other thing. Whatever ma was made into alcohol, is what is has the, the benefit. Yes. Has so, the so, so for it. those of you who say who, who will believe, you know, sometimes the doctor says a little bit of wine after a meal is good for the heart. It isn't the alcohol that's going to be beneficial. It is the grape juice. So drink some grape juice, and you'll be fine. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, you guys. It's been such a rich blessing that we've studied. And as for my portion in this, we're going to be looking over the scripture in Matthew chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. So if you can turn to that with me, we'll get started. This passage is where Christ is addressing the Pharisees. And in verse 18 and 19, we read, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he has a demon. 
the son of man come eating and drinking, and they say he is a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Now, we're not going to breeze over the fact that Christ himself says that he came eating and drinking. But what we are going to do is look at the context of this particular scripture. Now, we're looking at it and Right off the bat in verse, eight, the, verse 18, we see that Christ is making a comparison. So if you've ever dealt with someone talking about you or uh, gossip, you've dealt with this. And, and Jesus is kind of addressing the gossip that is happening. OK, so we're going to be looking at the comparison that is being made in verse 18 and 19. And believe it or not, it is a social comparison. We read in Matthew chapter three, verse one through three, we learned that John was known as a preacher in the wilderness. So a loner, so to speak. And in Matthew chapter three, one through three, you see it on your screen. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who, had, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So we see here, even in Isaiah is saying that he is crying out in the wilderness. He is in the outskirts of the city. He is a preacher that does not preach within the city, but on the outskirts of town. So he is a wilderness preacher, a loner, so to speak. OK. And when we think about Jesus, Jesus is almost the complete opposite. We know that he was a social being here when he was on Earth. He was around the people. He mingled with the people. And we know that from the story of the woman with the blood disorder in Matthew chapter nine, verse 20, where she felt like if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. And Jesus felt the power leave from him. And he asked, who touched me? And the disciples responded, Lord, all these people, how could you possibly feel that? It's a lot of people pressing against you. And we're bringing the attention to the fact that there was a crowd around him. Jesus also in the temple where the money changers were. He was in the temple, which was in the city. OK, and right after that, and he flipped over the table, which is famously known. I think people recognize that story for that particular reason alone. But after the fact, he said, bring the little children to me. So Jesus wanted to be with the people. We know in feeding the 5,000, not only did he feed them and eat with them, but he preached to them. And that's a number of 5,000. We can read in various verses, like in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, Matthew 4, verse 25, Matthew 8, 1, 19, Matthew 19 and 2, and also in Luke 9, 11, where large crowds followed Christ wherever he went. So we're looking at this comparison of Christ and John the Baptist. And this is the same thing of what Christ is doing in these verses. He is comparing. Now, the second half of that scripture, it says that John came nor eating and drinking. And we established that because he preached in the wilderness and it does not have where he was surrounded by crowds of people. But it also said that you said he hath a demon. Now, where did they get that from? Now we read the rest of Matthew chapter three, verse three, it gives a description of John and his life. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locust and honey, wild honey. So that description does not mention a man that hangs out in the city and goes to the marketplace. He eats local, he eats the food of the land, he eats the honey and the locusts. And he is not a man that was dressed for fashion, he dressed from what he had readily available. And so they got calling him a demon from, and we're gonna look at the story of the demoniac. And Luke chapter eight, verse 26 through 27, it speaks of where Jesus was traveling across the sea, uh, the, across the lake, from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met with a demon possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not wore clothes or lived in a house and had been living in the tombs. So they compared John the Baptist's lifestyle 
to the lifestyle of a, of a demon possessed person. And we can look at the demoniac where it says that he did not live in a home. He lived outside of the city in the tombs. And we know that the tombs is like the cemetery. So we know that that was not located in the city center. So they were saying they were talking about John the Baptist. So in that particular uh, passage, we read where they get that comparison from. But when Jesus mentioned that he was eating and drinking, we can see that Jesus mingled with the people. Even after his resurrection, he ate with the disciples. He ate at the home of Mary and Martha, because we can read that in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. And Jesus ate at the Levi's house. And I'm going to ask you guys to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 and 17. And it's going to really give some context to where the second half of this scripture is referring to. Chapter 2. Chap Mark chapter 2, verse 13 and 16. Mark chapter 2. Yes. 13 right. and 16. That's correct. And we read. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake and once again, a large crowd came to him and, bege and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him while Jesus was having dinner. So here it is. We're seeing Jesus partaking a meal at the house of this tax collector. Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Here's the other part of that. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating, the sin, eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Now we're thinking back on our verse where it says that Jesus came eating and drinking. OK, so we're not thinking about the word drinking in the modern sense as we use it in an alcoholic term. When you have a meal, you don't always drink alcohol. And as we learn that wine is also a, a word for unfermented. So he very well had a meal that did not include him being a social drinker, because that is what we're saying Christ was. He drank so Socially, we are looking at the social aspect of Christ that he spent it with the people, eating with them. He was connecting with them, not in a way to where he was becoming one of them, one of the boys. OK, so to speak, but in a way where he where they were willing to follow him. So he would not do anything to mess up his witness. Now, I want to kind of turn our thought a little bit because the last place that we're going to be talking about where Christ ate was with Zacchaeus. Okay. And Zacchaeus is, his story is unique because it combines the two, John the Baptist and Jesus. As we read in the, in Desire of Ages, pages 552, we read, only a few miles from Jericho, John the Baptist preached at the Jordan. So here it is again. John the Baptist is on the outskirts of the city and he is preaching. Zacchaeus had heard the call to repent. So Zacchaeus had heard John the Baptist preaching outside of the city. The instructions to the publican exact no more that which is appointed you. So he heard something that struck a chord with him. Though outwardly disregarded, had impressed in his mind, even though his life hadn't changed right away, it was eating away at his thoughts. He knew the scripture and was convinced that his practice was wrong. And now hearing the words reported to have come from the great teacher, he felt that he was a sinner in the sight of God. Yet what he had heard of Jesus kindled hope in his heart. OK, so Jesus knew what was going on in the heart of Zacchaeus. And when Zacchaeus came to town and we all know the song that he was up in the tree and Jesus looked up and said, I'm coming to your house today. Now, we, he wasn't going for a social call. This was a meal and a gathering of Bible study. And we also continue to read in Desire Ages, page 556, where it says to Zacchaeus, the Savior said, this day salvation come to this house. It wasn't a time for an alcoholic drink or anything else. Not only was Zacchaeus himself blessed, but all of his house with him. 
Christ went to his home to give him lessons of truth and to instruct his household in the things of the kingdom. They had been shut out of the synagogue by the contempt of the rabbis and the worshipers. But now the most favored household in all of Jericho, they're gathered in their own home about the divine teacher and heard themselves the word of life. So now we are looking at the whole story. The last part that I want to address is, but wisdom is justified by her children. We know for a fact that because of this Bible study, this impromptu fellowship of Bible study Jesus had with Zacchaeus, his life was changed. Because afterwards, he went back and he gave back double what he took from other people, right? He, the fruit of God's labor was seen. The wisdom of God knowing that Zacchaeus' heart was right for the picking was seen in that. We can also see that in the other works that Christ had done, the multitude were fed. The sick were healed, the dead was raised, the blind could see, the lame could walk. Sinners found hope and repentance in Christ, okay? And I just want to end it with this one thought, sisters and brothers. Jesus did not do this because Christ was a social drinker, but because he was on his father's business to seek and to save the lost. Amen. So for us to take that verse and take one word, wine bibber, and say that we're in good company because Christ drank is blasphemous to Christ. Mm -hmm. Because the whole contents of that whole verse was him saying, it doesn't matter what I do. You're going to talk about me anyway. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. So I just I'm so grateful that that I was able to kind of flush out that verse. And you know, we gotta be careful because remember what he's, what he's bring, bringing out is what they're saying about him. His enemies are saying about him. So if, uh, if the enemies are right and Jesus was a wine bearer, well, were the enemies right about everything? Because before that they called him that he was full of demons. Yeah. So what, are we gonna take their word for it? Clearly this is, this is as she said, making a comparison uh, Jesus' lifestyle was different than John the Baptist. That's all that, that this means, eating and drinking, not that he was drinking alcohol. We've got to be careful about attaching the, this statement uh, or the phrase social drinker. Oh, well, Jesus was a social drinker. I'm a social drinker, too, meaning that I only drink alcohol once in a while. That has nothing to do with what Jesus did here. And as you said, in the verses, and you can go back, brothers and sisters, and read it for yourself, it says, they say. Mm -hmm. He's not an admission of guilt. Yes, right. He's saying, this is, what, this they're is saying. what they're saying. And it didn't matter whether I came eating and drinking because John the Baptist didn't do that. And you still talked about That's him. Right. You'll talk about me. That's right. That's right. You know, we said a lot of stuff today. There was a lot of material. We could probably say a lot more. And, and you know, obviously, we're not here to tell you what to do, whether you should drink alcohol or whether you shouldn't. OK, but what we have presented here is to give you an idea of what the Bible does say and it doesn't say about it. Uh, if you are choosing to drink alcohol, then that is your choice. But we got to be careful to try to use the Bible to justify your decision to drink an alcohol because clearly the Bible does not justify the use of alcoholic beverages. Um, we see that, uh, again, the word wine can mean either one uh, fermented or unfermented, the context reveals, but God's blessing is usually on the unfermented. And so, um, you know, the Bible doesn't condone in any way the use of alcohol, whether it is, uh, and I'm talking about, you know, the intoxicating grape juice, uh, but, you know, we've mentioned wine, but there's all kinds of alcohol, uh, as we talked about last in our previous episode. The Bible does not condone that in little quantities or in greater quantities. Uh, I think the safest thing to do is to abstain from alcohol, and I think that's, that will be following the, uh, the Bible principles. You may have questions about uh, what we talked about today, and if you do, uh, we invite you to email us. The email is on your screen, on your screen Q, the letter Q-B-E-L at nfsda.org. And as we did today, if you have a question, we'll uh, try to answer that question first thing in our next episode. Shall we end with prayer? Absolutely. John Luke, could you lead us in prayer? Dearly Father, I praise you and thank you. I praise you that you have brought us together to read and study your word and to divulge more on this topic of alcohol, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit convicts us and those who listen 
and that we follow in your footsteps. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And thank you for joining us. We'll see you in the see you next, next time. episode.